Luigi's Mansion, a necessity for gracious living. While the Nintendo GameCube may have sold a lot worse than the majority of Nintendo home consoles, the platform with its quirky library of classics has since become one of the trendiest platforms of the past to collect for today. Even the GameCube's launch day would conjure up one of these endearing entries, which is the now legendary Luigi's Mansion. This 2001 action-adventure that took clear influence from Ghostbusters vastly differed from any Nintendo game that came before it. It would be Luigi's first solo adventure since the childhood-ruining Mario is Missing. This atmospheric, ghost-capturing romp would become one of the best-selling and most beloved GameCube games around, with it even receiving an enhanced remake on the Nintendo 3DS, a sequel and even a threequel on the Nintendo Switch. These games are simply amazing. Luigi's Mansion may be one of the first titles people think of when they hear the word GameCube, but what may come as a surprise is that initially, it was not intended for the GameCube at all. Instead, a different system altogether. So, with all that said, I am Lady Decade, and this is the early development of Luigi's Mansion for the Nintendo 64. Back at Nintendo's Space World event in the year 2000, the world would get to lay their eyes on Luigi's Mansion for the first time. Well, at least the concept of ideas. On display that day was a technological demo created to show off the graphical prowess of the upcoming GameCube platform. Within this demo was full motion footage that included clips of Luigi screaming in absolute terror, giving players a sneak peek at the direction of Luigi's adventures to come. To build on this, those in attendance would also witness Luigi running from a ghost in a foyer, ghosts playing cards in the parlour, ghosts circling Mario's younger brother, and an extremely gloomy looking Luigi standing outside a mansion with lightning flashing. As cool as all of this was, it would not be until one full year later that fans at the Electronics Entertainment Expo would get to see any actual gameplay of such a concept materialising. A newer game version closer to the retail release was shown off at Space World 2001. But if this is all in the lead up to the GameCube release, what about the Nintendo 64 version? This is where today's tale becomes a little bit more complex as the game that would eventually become Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube looked like a very different project in the days of the 64. So let's return to the beginning and discuss this iconic game's interesting roots. I learned much more about Luigi's Mansion's early development from a September 2001 interview whereby Nintendo Online Magazine interviewed Hideki Kono and Katsuhiko Kano. Hideki would serve as the game's director, with Katsuhiko working in graphic design. They would work as part of a star-studded team alongside Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka, producing the game with even music from Kazumi Totaka, you know, the man who sticks a hidden song in loads of games he works on. The interview I mentioned earlier, although initially in Japanese, was fortunately translated by Insider.com to English in 2005, giving us an educational insight into the origins of this classic. According to Kono, the historic game would come through as a series of ideas thrown around over time. In the early stages, an idea had been conceptualised to create a game encompassing stages that all revolved around a big house or apartment complex, with it at points being considered that this game should take place in a doll's house. Cross-referencing this information with another development interview that can be found in the official Nintendo Player's Guide for the game, Tadashi Sugiyama, the game's design director, states, We started with the idea of making a game in which the player explored a huge house, walking back and forth between rooms. As with many Nintendo projects, it wasn't long before Mario was thrown into the mix with the idea of him being the one to explore such a location. Mmm, this game sounds a lot like this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Luigi, look! One of those days. Sticking with their original ideas, it sounds like they could have been making Hotel Mario 64, as none of the spooky elements had been incorporated yet, which is hilarious come to think of it. Just to add, if you haven't subscribed yet, I would be grateful if you would consider doing so. Honestly, it's really helping me reach much bigger audiences and being able to afford to make better content for you, which means more silly costumes are on the way. Oh yeah, and if you don't, you'll receive a curse, which will cause your dick to fall off. Is that it? What? Ah! That's my dick! So subscribe now just to be safe. According to Kono in the player guide, he brings up that in the initial design phase of the game, Mario was our choice for the lead character. At that time, we were working on new ideas for an exploration game with many different rooms, in the same vein as the dungeon exploration sections of the Legend of Zelda games. During those tests, we changed the setting from a ninja house to something like a dollhouse. The dollhouse setting seemed natural because the player always looks through one of the walls to see the other three walls in the room. Katsuhiko Kano confirms this elsewhere, stating that the building in the game was a ninja mansion or Japanese-style house for a while. Still, through time, it would be chosen to resemble an old European-style building, which can obviously also be found in the United States. As for when it became a European-style mansion, Hideki Kono mentions that it became haunted when experimenting with lighting schemes, likely in the days one assumes when it was settled, this project would be for the GameCube rather than the 64. He comments, As we were developing the lighting scheme, we settled on a design that featured a lot of darkness and shadows. That's when we decided that the house should be haunted. Sugiyama backs this fact up in the game's player guide, adding, The house started as a Japanese-style ninja house. When we changed it to an American-style haunted mansion, we tried to think of a character who would work in those surroundings. Because the house is filled with ghosts, we wanted a character with a cowardly personality. This is when having Mario as the star character began to be brought into question. Speaking of Mario, in these early development days, there was also ideas to have locations outside the mansion that lined up with the Mario theme. These included a prairie desert and more, but this aspect was eventually scrapped to give the mansion itself greater precedence. Hideki Connell then outlines that, the composition that there would be three stories and a basement was decided early in development. The following designs became a matter of how do we keep the mansion varied. Since we were going with the western style, there is a huge staircase in the lobby, a bathroom in each floor, a training room, a music room, etc. We also came up with the idea of an underground cave to sort of extend the geographical environment. The early designs also had a sort of RPG system which upgraded the stage after certain actions. We sort of decided to work more with the cleaning machine, Vacuum. I wanted this to be a game that you could play repeatedly. So loads of concepts were thrown around that did not make the final cut. Hideki later adds that they had character designers working parallel to the team working on the map and industrial design for the game, confirming thoughts that this was going to be a Nintendo 64 title. With the GameCube technology emerging though, it just made sense to switch this title from a Nintendo 64 to a GC one, which Connor outlines wasn't tricky to do as all the previous cinematography they had made for the game was made using a real-time engine. The GameCube would allow the devs to do things which were impossible with the Nintendo 64, for example how stage areas could be lit, shaping the game's atmosphere. The game's software engineer Hiroki Sotoike comments that, The first thing that we wanted to do was create dynamic lighting with really crisp shadows. Since hardware development for the Nintendo GameCube was not complete at the time we started game development, we were able to make requests for technical capabilities 
capabilities to be added to the new system. Many of the features that we asked for were adopted. He explains further what this jump meant and brings up that they could finally attach real-time shadows to all objects. The hardware handled the direction of the shadows and how shadows interact with objects in the environment. Those capabilities were added to the graphics chip after the Luigi's Mansion team had specifically asked them. A luxury they did not have when the game was targeted to be a Nintendo 64 game. A further strength of the GameCube technology was the range of emotions that the improved graphics could allow characters to express. Hideki Kono, via the interview in the Nintendo Power Player's Guide, sees him add more info about the period whereby Mario was set to star in the game, commenting that it was when they were developing the game's lighting scheme, is when Luigi was finally settled on, commenting, since it isn't part of Mario's personality to be surprised or frightened, we decided that Luigi would be a better fit. Sugiyama adds, Because the house is filled with ghosts, we wanted a character with a cowardly personality. That's why we decided that Luigi was a good character. Armed with the GameCube's new graphics, Luigi would be the perfect character to display the range of emotion suitable for this horror game, with Connor commenting that the GameCube allowed for even one finger of Luigi to move. Even the inside of his mouth is animated and modelled well. We also worked on Luigi's emotions like joy, anger, humour and fear, all represented by his facial expressions. Aside from the developer's request for the GameCube to allow for technical capabilities to support their lighting scheme, something else is worth mentioning. Surprisingly, Luigi's Mansion would influence the GameCube controller itself too. Connell states, When we started developing the game, the Nintendo GameCube controller had not yet been designed. We wanted to use two analog sticks from the beginning. The idea was always to use one stick for movement and another stick for the directional control of what turned out to be Luigi's flashlight and vacuum. Because of the importance of the two sticks in the control scheme, we wanted to use fewer buttons than we would use in the game with more standard controls. While we did end up using all the buttons on the controller when we developed the functions of the Game Boy Horror, I think we successfully simplified control by implementing the use of the two sticks. What is also interesting is that Miyamoto would have had an influence on the game's control scheme, with Connell commenting that the use of the game's flashlight was his idea. Essentially, he wanted the game to utilise the A and B buttons more. Sotoike comments, Mr. Miyamoto suggested that the player should be able to turn off the light and wait for the ghosts to get close, then turn it on and quickly collect the ghost. I believe that he wanted the feature partially for the added functionality and partially for the fun of pushing buttons and making things happen. Good old Shifty Shigeru always has something to say. Another unique element of the final product of Luigi's Mansion is the game's excellent sound, which vastly shapes its atmosphere. What may surprise you is that when this one was first shown off at E3, the game wasn't well received in the sound department, so extra layers of creativity would be added to make this one special. Connell confirms that at E3, they thought that the background music wasn't very fun, so they came up with the idea that Luigi would interact with the music. The programming schedule was pretty tight, but we resolved the challenge ourselves, and we were able to add that feature. This feature is among the game's most charming aspects, helping us further immerse ourselves in Luigi's world. For example, when walking along a dark, unexplored hallway, Luigi will hum along to the music nervously. However, after he has captured all the ghosts in an area and the lights have been turned on, he will whistle the game's theme as he walks confidently. Here, check this out. Oh yeah. Aside from just the whistling, another iconic sound from the game is the constant sound of Luigi calling out for his brother Mario. Mario! Mario! 
Mario! Mario! In the Classic Player's Guide interview, Connor states that concerning this idea, that it was something that we added over the course of the development. There wasn't much to do with the A button except for examining objects and opening doors. One of our staff members suggested that Luigi should call out for Mario since Luigi's main motivation is to find his brother. A cool fact is that by tapping the A button, there are actually about 30 different variations in how Luigi calls out Mario's name, which differs depending on how much health he has. A great touch! Another departure from all games from the Mario universe before this one is its depiction of ghosts. In previous Mario games, most spooky entities would exist as boos, but this one has all sorts of ghosts and ghoulies. Sugiyama builds on Y, stating, We thought that standard Mario-style ghosts and boos were good for random mansion encounters, but we decided to go for a more human-looking style for event-related ghosts. That separates them from other ghosts and makes them more important. Connor also mentions that Mario, Boos, Bowser and Toad are all used sparingly throughout. This was to try and separate the game further from main mainline Mario games. One more strange development factoid I felt needs to be added to all this is that the GameCube version of the game was planned to be in 3D at one point. Some may not know this, but the GameCube was developed with circuitry capable of stereoscopic 3D. In an old Iwata Asks column, it is revealed that they at one point planned to sell screen attachments for the GameCube that could display this graphical effect, and a build of Luigi's Mansion would jump out particularly nicely. The 3D screen idea would be dropped due to cost concerns, with liquid crystal displays being crazy expensive to produce. The complete opposite of the sort of products Nintendo generally like to manufacture. Years later though, when Luigi's Mansion was released on the 3DS, the game could finally be played in the stereoscopic 3D that devs had intended. As you can see from all of this today, Luigi's Mansion underwent a development process that featured an insane amount of changes. The Ninja Dollhouse themed game set to star Super Mario on the Nintendo 64 would eventually become completely different on the GameCube. Hiroke Sotoike summarises Luigi's Mansion's development perfectly when he states, We wanted to create something that is innovative, something that no one else has experienced before. In that way, it really can't compete with any other games, because our game is different, unique. Now, over 20 years removed from this interview, Luigi's Mansion stands tall, proud and as cherished as ever, backing up that the devs who worked on this game achieved precisely what they set out to do. Luigi's Mansion may have never been released on the Nintendo 64, but it is one of the crown jewels of the GameCube library. By now, I hope you have hit that subscribe button, last warning as you do not want that curse that makes your dick fall off. Pick up my dick, please! No, I'm not picking up Pick your dick! Also, thank you to those who back the show on Patreon. There is a link to it in the pinned comments. If you enjoyed this one, check out my video on this weird Sega Genesis Mario All-Stars game.